Asians, right? So, all right, can you, can you see and hear my presentation at this point? I can see and I can hear. All right, y'all, once more. Okay, we're gonna be talking about human-robot interaction with three real, real world disasters where the HRI was not the disaster, but kind of. All right, uh, and this is work that's been done with Camille Perez, Ranjana Mehta, and myself. Uh, Camille is a, a, over in environmental and occupational health. Ranjana is in industrial and systems engineering. I'm over in computer science as the token roboticist on this. Okay, so our research has been to focus on emergency management teams, and that's team and technology interactions, and particularly how are the teams resilience and where's the barriers to cognition? And in particular, we focused on field responders with small unmanned aerial vehicle systems, as well as ground robots and marine vehicles. But anyway, with the small aerial vehicles, we've got three disasters, Katrina, Michael, and the Kilauea volcano. But before I talk about that, I'd like to, just as, as we're talking about metrics and, and situations and trust, first off, the ethics of doing HRI research during disaster is a little different because disasters are dangerous. So the everybody has personal safety issues. So if you're sending a team to collect data, there is personal safety issues. There's personal mental health risk. Uh, you know, there's there's uh, people who are injured, suffering, dead, large amount of destruction. Some people are not prepared to deal with that. And so I think that's also to keep in mind. And also responders typically try to minimize personnel and they don't want anybody who's not trained uh, are in emergency response and not essential there. So there is a real pushback to keep the footprint as small as possible if you get to go. Right. And uh, public accountability of the agencies is such as, as you would expect, but sometimes I see some of my colleagues forget this, the priority is, is the citizen not to allow other people to come in and do research. This wasn't just a great research event. And uh, something I think that's also keep in mind, if you or your colleagues or students have problems, uh, have any reservations about working with the police, the police are part of the 15 emergency response functions. So even though you may think, oh, we're going to be working with search and rescue. Well, the police officers are part of that. There are 15 groups that come together during disasters. But let's talk about the disasters, Hurricane Harvey, kind of the before and after uh, uh, view of, of that. So we have 13 pilots. They're out for two weeks flying to, uh, small unmanned aerial systems for this. And uh, Camille and Ranjana's team came out to do performance measures. There was the 10 minute PVT test. There was the heart rate and heart rate variability test measured by what was affectionately referred to as the man bras. And by the way, none of our pilots, including myself, look like that. Uh, and then the subjective uh, responses, the NASA TLX and the RPE. Okay, well, that didn't work. All right, the PV test, 10 minutes was just too long. People wouldn't, couldn't get through it. Uh, you know, we're working 14 to 16 hour days. Everybody's very tired. The man bra was uncomfortable. And when you're in the field, literally in the field for 14 hours, that, that comfort, what you can do during a staged world exercise is totally different. And so three of the six main pilots refused to wear them. Uh, the TLX, Oh, wow, that just doesn't work. I, it just does not fit. And the pilots were saying, okay, are there things you would just like us to fill in for you? Because none of this makes sense to us. It doesn't apply. Uh, and then the RP was kind of fun because one group said, I, you know, and the poor graduate student was like, oh, one group was, was reporting ergonomic problems, you know, with their neck and this. And I was like, really? And I looked at the group and it was the least experienced group and they didn't have the right kind of gear. So, so it wasn't really a great, you know, it, it, that her conclusion, her initial conclusion was meaningless without context. Now let's go to the, uh, the, uh, the volcanic eruption uh, in 2018. We were flying there as well. Uh, notice, you know, so that's lava, you know, real lava. Notice that we, the pilots, are wearing uh, gas masks because of that gas plume you can see over there of SO2 gas. So that, that also adds, you know, not only danger, but it also adds ergonomic interference in what we're doing cognitive there. Anyway, 
things were better in terms of the PBT got it down to three minutes. We'll just do the three minute version. Camille and Ranjo wanted three minutes. And Ranjo said, okay, no more man bras. We'll do the wristbands. So, and and Camille was like, no surveys. We'll just, yeah, the, the TRLX is just not, not gonna work. All right, uh, no, still. The PBT test was getting, uh, you could get it in the morning, but not in the evening, because again, you're doing these extraordinarily long days. You get back, your first priority as a pilot is to is to uh, start recharging all the batteries, repair your gear, then rehab yourself. And while everybody's waiting their turn to do it, you've passed out on the bed drooling. Okay, the wristband, totally uncomfortable. Well, first off, I knew there was gonna be a problem when, um, we're told is that you've got to wear it on your dominant hand. And we're like, dominant hand. Yeah, the hand you wear your wristwatch. You know, it's like, well, we wear our wristwatch for a reason. Well, can you move it to the other one? And it ended up getting much grumbly. Okay, the wristband is cheap. So after about eight hours, it cuts into you. So basically, uh, everybody was just finding ways not to wear them. But even if they did wear them, and I was one of the ones I tried, but I couldn't remember when to press it because you were supposed to press it at when you started to fly, you were supposed to press it when you landed and you were do that. And we don't do checklists like that. So there was not a checklist that, that said to do this or remind. So we were all forgetting. So that was there. <coughs> all right, later that summer, Hurricane Michael got another shot at this. Uh, and, and notice we, we have a core group of, of pilots from Crasar there, there. So, so we're kind of getting trained on how to do this ourselves. All right, the PBT, great. We've still got that. The wristband this time, no pushing. The, uh, that you won't have to do it. You can figure it out from our flight logs when something interesting was going on, when we were up in the air and we were landing. Okay, you can infer off of that. Okay, and again, no surveys. Okay, the PVT worked really great. It's the same three three minute one, but Camille was clever. She realized that as soon as we came back in and started giving the SD card with data to the data manager, she would grab us and say, hey, I need you to spend uh, five minutes resting in this air conditioned car leaning back. When you've been working in a hurricane and it's like a thousand percent humidity, that air conditioned car was like, Oh, yeah, I can be experimented on to the cows come home. So people were actually, it went from being a chore to being yes. Now, if she had waited till we'd gotten back to where our home base was, we'd have been tired recharging all this other stuff. So that was clever on her part. Uh, you know, the wristband still. This time we didn't have to turn them on and off, but the software is not really set up to, to Q&A in the field. So it was reporting stuff apparently, but when they got it back, they realized something had been corrupted. Okay, so when designing test mes methods for field robotics, and I think what we've learned with disasters applies to field robotics in general. No, 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 the real world is different than a staged world. I mean, in the real world, their job is to do their job, not to be your research assistant, the way it is when it's a stage world and you're paying them or you're you know, trying to appeal to their better sense of duty. So their job in disasters is to respond to the disaster. And if you are working in the field, particularly in a disaster or something like an offshore rig or any process safety, you're not gonna be able to take your entire lab out there to observe. And you may not have electricity or internet. And again, we've already talked about personal safety, but ergonomics, 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 that was a huge drawback. And then the responders won't remember new procedures. So if you're thinking, I can't be in the field to shepherd them, they need to press buttons, they need to write this down, they need to remember that, good luck with that because all of our studies, the data we're collecting is showing extreme fatigue comes in by day two and it never gets better. Uh, you get a little bit of an improvement if you get a full night's sleep, which you usually don't. But by the way, if you're in the field with the responders, even if you're back at the base of operations, you probably won't be in much better cognitive state anyway, so you're gonna forget stuff. So really important to think about prototyping things. And context is critical for designing measures and interpretations. So you really need to understand the responders workflow beforehand and then proto the test methods before you put them out in the field.
And we had a great team who worked with us for the past two years on this. And uh, Camille and Ranja and I are happy to answer any questions about this. And I'm going to stop here.